to, to everyone here, those watching um, online. Um, thank you for your commitment to the study of God's word. It's, uh, it, it, that, that means more to me than you have any idea um, as, your, as your pastor to, to feel like that we've created something where people have a hunger for God's word is a, is a wonderful thing. And I, I want you to hear, hear me here because this is important. I realize that it's not easy for, for, for you to get out here on a weeknight um, and especially to do it three nights in a row. I get it. It's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, I, I'm one of the ones teaching and it's a challenge for me to get here um, three, three, three nights with all the kids I have and everything else. So I, I, I appreciate more than you know your, your commitment to this. I also know this, <clears throat> and I want you to please hear my heart here. I know that this has been a lot of information. And having been a student and done a lot of this, I know that maybe some of you at this particular point, you might feel a little overwhelmed with, with the information. I'm wondering, may, maybe is a study like this, is this really for me? Um, you know, let, let me say, yes, it is for you. And please hang in. I, I know it's a challenge, but hang in with us because th this is going somewhere. Um, pieces will come together. We, we, we really have a direction where we feel like we need to get. And, and, I, and I think you'll be, you'll be blessed. So that being said, let's do a little review as to what we've learned so far. Once again, just to sort of get our minds going again. We've learned that the dramatic narrative of the book of Revelation is the retelling of the battle of Jericho as found in the book of Joshua. Um, we asked you to read Joshua one through six. Um, and, and when you read Joshua one through six, you should be able to see as you read through Revelation, how, how that gives a narrative, sort of a backbone of what is going on. It runs through the entire book and it gives us categories to understand the story. <clears throat> we also have learned that time, although we are reading forward in the book of Revelation, um, time, chronologically in many ways is going backwards and it's unwinding all of the things to get us back to and restoring all things back to the garden. And th that is significant because if you remember, um, scripture starts with a wedding in the garden with Adam and Eve and it ends with a wedding in the garden in the book of Revelation. It's not coincidental. The, 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 there's themes here. And again, if there is divine authorship of scripture, which there is, and we totally believe that, then those categories, God knew what he was doing even when he was writing with Moses and he knew what he was writing with John. He, he knew how this was coming together. We also learned that Revelation is a directional or a, um, a literature of trajectory, which it's moving from low to high, which historically is known as classic comedy. And again, that's a category that's tough for us because we think of comedy as like a sitcom, ha ha funny, when in reality it is a, um, it's a direction. Just as an aside, um, with the classic comedies that we have that, that, that ended um, in weddings, um, you, you have a, a story like most of you all have probably heard or seen, The, the Lord of the Rings. Um, it's not by coincidence that there's three um, of those books and three of those movies. Tolkien was a, a, a student of literature, he knew. And so he's framed this wonderful story of the Lord of the Rings in three sets because the great comedy is the divine comedy, which is in three volumes. And if you remember in the Lord of the Rings starts off in the Shire with some people that would never be able to accomplish what they did, by the end they do. And if you remember, how does that end? It ends with them all being married in a wedding. So the Lord of the Rings is comedy. And, and you wouldn't think that. You're like, no, that's sci-fi. That's no, it, it, Tolkien knows what he's doing. So I want you to see that trajectory and how that would work and how maybe a first century um, person would have seen the book of Revelation. We've also learned and seen the significance of words and vocabulary and themes that have shown this correspondence between the gospel of John and the book of Revelation and vice versa and how they're talking to each other. Um, we've also seen how each book can help interpret each other when read together. And we've learned that this type of literature, which is called a diptych, is found in literature, specifically in the, uh, you know, before the first century and, and before the time of Christ and during the time of Christ. Um, and we already have biblical books 
that already fit this category, which is Luke and Acts, and they can be read together. So this is not, this is not something that's not found in antiquity. It's plentiful, but it's also already something that we should know as students of Scripture that Luke and Acts were written as a diptych, and now we're starting to see that John and Revelation are a diptych. Revelation would have been penned first, and then the Gospel of John after, and possibly even almost simultaneously. John was told to write, if you remember, in the book of Revelation, and he did, and that was the book of Revelation. He then has written John to speak to that book and show the correspondence between heaven and earth, which is a massively important category in Judaism. If you remember in scripture, when you go back to the original creation, heaven and earth were together. God walked with mankind, they were together. In chapter three, we have a break in that fellowship and that's called sin. I love, uh, I don't know who it was, but somebody said, if there wouldn't have been sin in the Bible, we'd have had a pamphlet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, um, but, but we don't, we have, because we need it. Have a bar. <laughs> and uh, so, so when this has erupted, you, you see throughout Israel's history, um, you see it in the tabernacle, you see it in the temple, that there's always this place somewhere on earth where heaven and earth are meeting in the Holy of Holies. We see it in the person of Jesus, don't we? That heaven and earth meet. And, and when we end scripture, everybody's not flying away to heaven. Heaven and earth are coming together. And how did Jesus tell us to pray? Your will be done on as it is in. So these categories of heaven and earth together are massively influential in, in, in Judaism and in, in, in our Jewish category. So John is giving us these parameters of this. And again, this is the revelation of, and so we're starting to see here what's, what's going on. And so understanding that these books correspond with each other helps us to put some things together, which we will, we will do this, this evening. In John 151, the gospel of John, um, Jesus is speaking to Nathaniel, and he, he says to Nathaniel, you will see. The commentators note, and anybody who would have studied original language would note that that word you, which should have been singular to Nathaniel, is plural in the text, which means that the reader, us the reader, are also invited in the text. You will see something. And what we will see is heaven opened and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, this imagery that we're promised in John 151 is not found within the four corners of the Gospel of John. So, so we're told to be looking for something and to see something that is not found in the Gospel of John. We have to have the book of Revelation to see this vision and we will see how that works. And we're, that's what we're gonna be looking at this evening, things like that. If you are in John, you're, you're told in chapter three, the gospel of John, that the bridegroom comes looking for his bride. Well, in the four corners of the gospel of John, we do not find Jesus's bride. We, we have some really cool stories of women that, anticipate, if we're reading it correctly, what his bride would look like. But we do not find the bride if we don't have the book of Revelation. We are also told that in the beginning of John, that the temple is cleansed. And people don't know what to do with that because Jesus didn't cleanse the temple then. He cleansed it towards the end of his ministry. Had he cleansed it early, as in John, he had never been able to do any of the stuff that he would have done. Why does John have Jesus cleansing the temple at the beginning? Why has that chronologically been sort of moved? Once again, we do not have an answer for that unless we read the book of Revelation. Jesus doesn't honor the wedding customs of wine in John 2. Remember, he gives the good wine at the end, right? Remember, after they're well drunk, it says. You know, some of you are like, yes, Cooper's hawk, baby. Um, 
But, but he does honor the custom in Revelation. And we'll see that. So you have to have both work, books working together to understand some of these categories. And so that's what last night and this evening are all about, how to read and how to see how they correspond and how they speak to one another. Last evening, we showed you how to read consecutive correspondence. It's sort of a normal way in which we read sort of straight through. And we showed you how they can be read together. Now, that's not the primary way they're to be read. The primary way that they're to be read is what we're gonna talk to you this evening. But if you were to read Luke and Acts, the primary way they read together is parallel and consecutive. And then the secondary would be chiastic, which we'll talk about this evening. So this evening, we're gonna introduce you to the primary way in which these books speak to each other. And this is called chiastic writing. Um, it, It comes from the Greek letter that looks like an X, chi, key, um, and th- that, that will we'll show you how that works. But this language is employed in scripture and, and there's so much of it that it, it really helps you to redefine categories and helps you to put things in different perspectives. In, in many ways, it sort of turns things inside out or it makes you think about things where Jesus might say something that, hey, um, you know, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. And you go, what? How's that work? What are you you saying? Um, It frames new horizons. It gives us categories and ways to see things. It contextualizes things because you can understand the ending of a book by the beginning and the beginning by the end. And it's a very very common form of writing in antiquity. Um, And it's super useful and needed in what we would call an oral tradition. That's A-U-R-A-L. It's like auditory, oral, where you don't have a printing press. You, you, you only have ways to talk. And so memorization, and many of you all know that. Many of you have had to memorize things and you try to sit down and how do I memorize this? In societies that had stories to tell, that they, they learned to tell it chiastically. So what I wanna do for a minute is I wanna try to introduce you very slowly. We're gonna wade into this Um, throughout the evening, and we'll get deeper and deeper and deeper um, as as we go. But I wanna try to introduce you to chiastic writing. And some of this you'll see right away. So in Matthew 23, 12, we we have these directions here. Whoever humbles himself, that's low, will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. It's, it's, It's a way to see things. And the Corinthian correspondence, Jesus says, or no, Paul says about Jesus, he says that though he was rich, he became poor. That we through his poverty might become rich. He shows us where that happened, right on the cross. This is, this is a way to see things in a different way. And it's, it's a way we're not used to sort of reading, reading things or writing this way, but this is the way people did things in antiquity. So moving from here, this is the way a lot of things were written in antiquity, where you would start off at the beginning, you would have a rising action, climax, and the word for, in Greek for climax is what? It's a ladder. It's, it's a ladder. And so we've got a ladder here. And then if you can go up to the center, you can come back down. And if you all have been here for a long time, you've heard me at some point preach on the gospel of Matthew, where I told you there's seven mountains and they correspond with each other. It's chiastic writing. The first mountain is in chapter four where the devil takes Jesus up to the top of the mountain, doesn't he? And he says, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, the last mountain is in chapter 28. And Jesus goes up on the mountain. What does he say? He says, all the kingdoms of the world have been given to me. All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. They correspond with each other. The, the second mountain on the way up is the mountain of the attitudes. What does he say? Blessed are you. 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 Well, the corresponding mountain is in Matthew 23. What does he say? Woe to you. Woe to you. 
Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Woe to you. He's, he's reenacting Moses, Noah, Moses, um, Moses on Gerizim and Ebal. Remember when he did the blessing and the cursings? Blessed are you, cursed. So, and then we go all the way to the center mountain. It's where Jesus is on the top of the mountain. And if you remember when Moses went to the top of the mountain, who could come up? Good, somebody, good. All right, good. Praise God. But Jesus is at the top of the mountain and it says all the, the blind and the lame come to him and they were healed by the God of Israel. And so, and so we have these correspondences. And so I want you to see here that this is, this is a way in which things can be written. And of course, there's other mountains, that other, but I'm just, I'm just trying to get you to see how these things work. There's the two mountains of sort of solitude and then the climax in Matthew 15, which is directly in the center of the book. Let me give you another Example, if we were coding this, it would look like this. We would start with A, and it would be one. And it would move through to a center, and then it would come back to A2. And it goes like this, or it goes like this. And believe it or not, most of the things that you're reading in Scripture are written this way. In fact, you have a paper on the Gospel of Mark that not only shows this, but then almost every passage in Mark every is written. Verse, every other the verse. Climax of a chiastic form. It's crazy. All the way to the end. Like you, you want to go deep, that one will cure insomnia. Um, <laughs> but so, so, so seeing this <clears throat> in the way it's written, I'm going to now give you a really small, really easy, really vivid, one of those, oh, cool, on just Revelation. Because Revelation and John both do this, and they do it together because they're speaking to each other. But just to give you an idea of how this, this works, this is the book of Revelation because it also is written chiastically. And you can see here, there's the prologue and the epilogue. There's the seven epistles. There's the seven angels. There's the seven seals. There's the seven bowls. There's the 144,000 saints and seven trumpets. There's the 144,000 saints and seven angels. There's the two witnesses. There's the two beasts. There's the woman clothed with the sun and the woman's seed keeps the commandments of God. There's the dragon in heaven and the dragon who persecutes the woman on the earth. The woman flees to the wilderness. The woman flees to the wilderness and right smack dab in the center of the book, Satan is cast out. And that's the way these books are written. So what we're going to do now that you sort of, do, do you, have, I, have I made that somewhat clear? And, and, um, is mud? Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to, since you sort of maybe get, get this framework here, we're going to now move into showing you how John and Revelation correspond to each other. And uh, Warren, if you want to make your way over, I think you're going to go to the podium, aren't you? All right. He's going to go to the podium. This guy's great, isn't he? Come on, Warren, isn't he great? Thank you. <laughs> and if you did not get this on the way in, please um, go out and get one because I think we passed this out. It's also stuff I think you can find in the hand. But this is really important that you got this this evening. This is important. And you may say, why is it so important? You guys do, you use the board so much. Yeah, the problem is when we decided to use the board, it looked like this. <laughs> and so unless you brought binoculars, which maybe some of you all are, are Boy Scouts and you're prepared, um, I, I doubt you probably will be able to see this as clearly as you can see this. And what I'm going to ask for this particular interaction, which will be really fantastic, is could we cut the lights in the sanctuary up a little bit more? I realize I know I'm killing the recording. And Hey, there you go. Good. <clears throat> All right. I got some hand claps. Re remember that. T tell me when, I, when, when you see me on the weekend. Chip, thanks so much for turning the lights on. You know, uh, but but, but, but uh, th 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 that being said, Warren's going to take us here, and we're going to see how John and Revelation communicate with each other, which will help us to understand how these books are written and ultimately will lead us to no fear. So I'm assuming everybody who's going out is getting sheets of paper. Good. 
I was like, man, I've already ran them off, man. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm already, <laughs> well, I'm, already, I'm, already I'm already killing it. So anyway, let's let, uh, let's let Warren do his thing. Go ahead, man. Um, it's wonderful to see you again. You have no idea how encouraging it is for us to see the interest in the Word of God. And I hope that in this you see the beauty of the Word of God. Mm. I mean, it is symmetry is beauty and the balance of the Word of God. It's unbelievable um, how it's just lovely. It's wonderful. And I think tonight, hopefully, this will help even to elevate further your understanding of the inspiration of the Word of God. We believe that the Scriptures are inerrant, without error, and they are inspired by a divine, eternal mind. And I don't know how, how could anyone construct this unless they were inspired of the Spirit of God and someone is speaking from another world to us. So uh, what I'm going to show you tonight is how, the, Chip showed you just before how Revelation is chiastic. We can do the same thing with John. Mm -hmm. But what we're going to do is show you how both of the books together are chiastic. And we're assuming a certain familiarity with these books. We have to. And this will register with many of you, hopefully. But you have it. You've got handouts. They're downloadable online. And hopefully that way you can study it and see the context of it. The contexts are significant as well. <clears throat> this particular chiasm is very different than the ones in individual books because we're relating two books. We're, look at, we're looking at John and Revelation and how do they relate. And the way this kind of a chiasm works is not with this inverted V. If we're relating the two books together, it goes cyclically. So that, for example, A, in the beginning of the heavens, of the, of the heavens and the earth, was the Word. This is from John. The beginning of John looks back to the original creation. And God was the Word. The Word was God. And all things were made by Him. So we read that, but then we go down to the very bottom. A is related to A prime. At the very bottom, you're at the end of Revelation. You were at the beginning of the Gospel. Now you're at the end of Revelation. And there we're told, John says, Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end. And behold, I make all things new. And he says, I saw a new heavens and earth. So you see how those are related? But it's a circle. It's like a large circle through both books. Uh, and I think this is significant too. You've got, Jesus says at the end, at the beginning it was the Word, but now at the ending we have Jesus as well, which shows that he transcends time. He is not subject to time, he's eternal. He's divine. And then all things were made by him. John tells us now at the end of Revelation, Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. It's a new creation. And the word new in the Bible, more than just new in time, is contrasted with old, it means redeemed. He's going to redeem the world, take away the curse, all the consequences of our human sin. Behold, I make all things new. And in this, you can see that he is greater than Solomon. Solomon said what? There's nothing new under the sun, remember that? Everything is vanity. And he was the most, the wisest among men, but Jesus is not, does not participate in wisdom. He is wisdom. Paul says he is the wisdom of God. And so he comes and answers Solomon. Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. Jesus says what? I make all things new. He is a great, has a greater wisdom than Solomon, which shouldn't surprise any of us. So we're reading from the very beginning of the Gospel, we're making a circle to the very end of Revelation, and the two books are aligned in the middle. 
So we're reading like this. It makes a big circle. See? Like for the, the second one. Jesus is the light. And John tells us at the very beginning of the gospel that a quarrel breaks out between darkness and light. He said the, the darkness did not like the light, tried to overcome it. So there's a quarrel that breaks out at the beginning of the gospel between darkness and light. Emblematically, that's going to relate to Jesus, who is the light, and the religious leaders who want to extinguish the light, and Jerusalem, which is the city of night. The darkness will try to extinguish the light. Now that quarrel is initiated at the beginning of the gospel, but it is not resolved within the four corners of the gospel. It's resolved, however. I mean, it's a tension. We're thinking, well, how is this quarrel? How does it end? Well, when we read down to B prime at the end of Revelation, we read the Lamb is the light, and there is no night. The light at last extinguishes the darkness. You see how that works? In other words, you're opening up <clears throat> ideas. If, if you read a book, at the beginning of the book, you'll see the the tension, the things that drive the narrative. But when you come to the end of the book, you expect those tensions to be resolved, right? Questions to be answered. How is it all reconciled? That's the way we read a book. It's the way we read John. In John, Jesus comes, he leaves his father, he comes to earth looking for his bride. John says, I've heard the voice of the bridegroom. But there is no bride within the four corners of the gospel. That should tell you immediately that what good is a, a bridegroom without a bride? Not very good at all, is it? Where's the bride? We see the bridegroom come from heaven at the beginning of the gospel. At the end of Revelation, the bride descends from heaven, right? So the two books are married. They're one book, which imitates the mystery union of the two marital partners that become one flesh. Revelation is completing the dramatic narratives that are introduced in the Gospel of John. The next one, the bridegroom, at the beginning of the Gospel, this is C now, at the top of the page, he comes from heaven, the Word was made flesh, the Word that was with God in the beginning in heaven is made flesh and dwelt among us on earth. So Jesus comes down from heaven, and he invites, he and his disciples are invited to come to the wedding. Remember the wedding in John 2, the wedding at Cana? He and his disciples are invited to the wedding is important. That anticipates his own wedding. It's not his wedding, but it anticipates his wedding. And there's a twofold invitation to come when the disciples come. John highlights four of the disciples for a significant reason, as we'll see. But anyway, uh, he invites the disciples to come, and they go and tell their brother. In this case, Andrew tells Philip, and he says, come and see. Come and see. You have a twofold invitation of the bridegroom to come to follow him. Now, reading circularly, going down now to C prime, which, which balances it, Chiastically, in Revelation, the bride descends from heaven. See that? Jesus comes from heaven at the beginning of the gospel. At the end of Revelation, the bride descends from heaven. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears come. The twofold invitation, anyone can come. It, John is inviting you to the wedding of the Lamb. Anyone can come. Twofold invitation. Let the one come and let the one who hears. I heard about this wedding. You're invited to come. Open invitation. But there, it's balanced. The, the, the bridegroom at the beginning of the gospel, the bride at the end of Revelation. You see how these are related. Now, this circle that I'm drawing, as we read through this, we're going toward the middle. But that's significant. It's chiastic. The mathematical demonstration of a chiasm is really a helix. You know the spiral? It's helical. And that's significant. 
as we'll see. All right, D, the word of God tabernacles among men and they see his glory. How many of you have read that in John 1.14 and you've thought, I wish I could have been with the apostles, I wish I could have seen Jesus tabernacling among us, right? That's a significant verse, by the way, but the, the intimacy of being with Jesus for those three, three and a half years of his earthly ministry. Well, look at what John does with that in D prime. The promise at the end of Revelation is God will tabernacle among us forever. Not for three years, but forever. We will be with him and we will see his glory. It's very clearly promising. It's connecting the end of the, uh, the, end of the, of the diptych, the end of the two books that are read together, is showing he's resolving all of the issues that were introduced at the beginning. Um, e. Jesus is invited to the wedding of Cana and his mother sees that the bridal pair are about to suffer the social embarrassment of not having enough wine. And so Mary asks her son to do something for them. This beginning of his miracles. Remember you were told that in the Gospel of John, the beginning of the of the signs of Moses is to turn the water to blood, an emblem of death. Jesus will turn it to blood, which is an emblem of death, but it speaks of new life. He's greater than Moses. That theme of Jesus is greater than all runs right through this. Well, Jesus tells his mother, my hour has not yet come. What is that hour? That's the hour of his furnishing the wine for his wedding. And so, but he does, in kindness, he provides, remember he fills up the six water pots and fills them with water and then the water becomes wine, miraculously. And so the couple is spared the embarrassment of running out. And that wine is commended. The steward goes to the bridegroom and said, this is the better wine, this, is, this wine is wonderful. He's, what John is doing, is he's encouraging your thirst, you'll want to taste that wine that Jesus provides. He's encouraging you to the communion table, to the Eucharist. And, but he tells, he rebukes the bridegroom. He said, you've done this all backwards. You haven't respected the custom of the wedding. You, provide the, you provided the good wine at the end. You should provide the good wine at the beginning and then when the people are less sensitive, when they have drunk, then you provide the worst wine. It's, it's human, it's very human, isn't it? But that's the custom. Now, why does John go into all of that detail to tell us that? Why do we need to know that? We, we wanna know that that's the best wine, we, we're not surprised at that, it's the better wine. But why does he tell us all of that? The question is, does Jesus then not respect the customs of the wedding? Because if he's to be our bridegroom as the people of God, then we wanna know that he respects the customs of the wedding. And that, you read commentaries in vain, they don't answer these questions because the answer to that question is found in Revelation. Jesus makes wine twice, did you know that? In chapter 19, he treads out the wine of the wrath of God. Like, a, like they would crush the grapes, remember? Jesus treads out the wine of the wrath of God. 19 of Revelation. In chapter 17, Lady Babylon is drunk. So after they are drunk, he provides the worst wine. And he does respect the customs of the marriage. But you have to read the two together in order to see that. What does that mean? That means that this is the time of the invitation to the wedding. Come and taste this wonderful wine of the gospel. It's a Eucharist wine. It's his blood. It washes away all of our sin. 
You see, it's open to anyone. But if we refuse, if we refuse, there awaits for us the wine of wrath that Jesus himself must serve. It makes sense if you read it together, but the questions are left unanswered if you're reading the gospel alone. And chapter two, again, F, Jesus pours out the defiling coins on the temple floor. He's purging the temple. And he begins with a cord of whips. The temple of his body, he's, he's anticipating the judgment that will come on that temple. He begins with a cord of whips because his, the, the visitation of his judgment, when the religious leaders have him crucified, his judgment will begin with the Roman scourging. The temple of his body, what happens to the temple, anticipates his temple being judged. And when he overturns the dovecotes, the Spirit of God, emblematically in the doves, flees that temple. It's left desolate. The house is de left desolate. And ultimately, Jesus will give up the Spirit at the end of his judgment on the temple of his body. He pours out, he overturns the coins. Remember that? And the coins are the Tyrian didrachma. They have the emblem of Hercules, uh, Melkart, Hercules on the, on the uh, obverse, or the, yeah, the obverse of the coin. So here are these little, these idol images defiling the temple. Um, the religious leaders, he says, have been made the temple a house of merchandise. Buying and selling and cheating, money changers and selling sacrificial animals and then bringing them around the table and then selling them again. It was a den of thieves, it was a money making machine. In F, angels pour out vials of judgment on Babylon, like the, like the coins that were poured out the vials are poured out on Babylon, and the merchants of the earth mourn the loss of her great wealth. They mourn the loss of their great wealth, but the true wealth was Jesus, and who mourned for the loss of that wealth? Um, I want to jump down to Revelation here. Uh, Revelation, we are at um, let's see, we are at no, 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 I'm sorry. Let's, let's stay with uh, the gospel back up to the top. G. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> the Samaritan woman asks Jesus, you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? That's the key to understanding that passage. John writes the question, he doesn't answer it, he expects you to answer it. Whenever the, whenever the evangelists raise a question, they want you to answer it. When Jesus stills the sea in the storm, the disciples say, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And that question is left unanswered by Mark, but Mark wants you to say, this, this is not just a man. He's exceeded the horizons of humanity. He is a God-man. He had been asleep through a storm, exhausted. That's his humanity. But he commands the waves and the sea. They hear the voice of their creator, and they are tamed. That question is important. The key to the whole Samaritan woman narrative is when she asks Jesus, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? The answer to that question is, is key. And Jacob was weak in his thigh. You remember when he wrestles with God? His name means deceiver, but when he wrestles with God, God Moses says a man came to wrestle with him. That's a very physical physicality, it's very human. And then at the end, John says, I've seen the face of God. It was a pre-incarnate Jesus, the God-man, who was wrestling with him. And he wanted a blessing, and the, the Lord touched him in the hip, 
disabling the hip, that's the pivot of strength of the wrestler. What good is a wrestler if his hip is disabled? So Jacob has become weak in the flesh, and that's when he's given the name Israel. When he becomes weak in the flesh, he becomes mighty with God, the one who prevails with God for men. That's his name. But he goes off then with a limp. He's never right. His posture is never right again. He goes with that limp. Look at what corresponds to that. Um, Jesus comes on a white horse of strength. Uh, Jesus wears the banner of his great strength on his thigh. He comes as the equestrian on a white horse in chapter 19. What is visible to the, of an equestrian on a horse is the thigh. That's the most prominent part of the body. And on his thigh is the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is greater than Jacob, isn't he? There is no weakness in him. What was weak in Jacob is the emblem of his great strength. They're inviting you to admire the bridegroom and to fall in ever deeper love with him. Now, I want to jump down to um, H, prime, the bottom part in Revelation. We looked at this passage Sunday. The whore of Babylon has a relationship with seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the seventh has not yet come. When the seventh king comes, he abides in Babylon a little while. And John sees her and wonders. He can't imagine what he's seeing. And we are told you need wisdom. Here is the mind that has wisdom. You have wisdom? We ask above. That's H prime. Now look at H. It's the account still of the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman meets Jesus at a well. The well in the Old Testament is where the prophets meet their brides. Rebecca is identified at a foreign well of Haran. Uh, Rachel is identified at the well of Haran, a foreign well. She's beautiful and a virgin. Zipporah, the wife of Moses, is, is recognized at the well of Midian. In the Samaritan narrative, Jesus is sitting upon a well. He's sitting upon the waters. And the Samaritan woman comes to him. And she wants to taste his living water. And Jesus says, go call your husband. And she lies. I have no husband. But the truth is very different. The Samaritan woman has had, this is H now, has had a relationship with seven men. Five have fallen. One she has now is not her husband. Jesus is the seventh to come to bring her the love that she longed for, thirsted for. And he abides in Samaria for two days, a little while. And when John and the disciples return and see Jesus speaking with a woman, no rabbi would ever do that. A Samaritan woman, no Jew would ever do that. They wonder. They can't speak. They are so startled at that. Here is the mind that has wisdom. We'll look at that more carefully on Sunday. Uh, I, the Samaritan woman, invites the city to come out to meet a man who satisfied her thirst. The Samaritan woman had come to the well to draw water. When Jesus introduces himself as the Messiah. She was looking for the Messiah. She had faith, although she had a very checkered history. When she, when, when she finds Jesus, 
and believes in his living water, she leaves her water pot. John, why did John tell you that? She left her water pot. Why would she leave the one that she loves and has just found? She forgot she was unmindful of that. She immediately had to go into the city to tell everybody what. She only went to the well at noon to avoid the company of the women who went in the morning and the evening and not in the hot sun. She went alone. She had a very involved past. She was ashamed. That's why she lied to the Savior. I have no husband. He so gently answered her in truth. She leaves immediately, goes into the city to tell everybody what. Come meet a man that told me everything I ever did. The very thing she never wanted to talk about. Come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Her shame has become her testimony. Is he not the Christ? And the whole town comes out. And they believe, when they hear Jesus, they believe that he is the Messiah who has come for the Samaritan as much as for the Jew. And so they ask him to stay, and he stays for two days, a little while. The Samaritan woman invites the city to come out to meet the man who has satisfied her thirst. So now we're in chapter 4. You see, and we're also in uh, chapter 17, so we're working our way to the center of Revelation backward and to the center in John forward. So Jesus, oh no, um, John, John, Jesus testifies about John that he was a bright and shining lamp. Two great lights, John the Baptist, the most righteous man born of woman, the Spirit of God moved mightily in him, Jerusalem killed him. Yeah. When you're talking about the Samaritan woman, she invites the city to come out and meet a man who satisfied her thirst. Flip down to Revelation, because this is strong. We missed this here. Oh, yeah. the, the, the bride of the lamb invites the city to come out and meet a man who can satisfy the thirsty. Yeah, I shouldn't have left that out. Thank you. You're welcome. It's small for me, too. <laughs> so it's a challenge. But thank you for that. Yeah. It, 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 she... it, is this not incredible to you? I mean, and, and, and we're only going to go to the center axis as we go through John and come back up Revelation. What's missing is the other two things, and they're there. We just, they're, we're not doing those tonight. We're just doing enough to get you. To, I, I just, like, this... If this is not like just cool to you, I, I don't know what else could be cool. <clears throat> I mean, seriously, it, I, I, like when, when I saw this the first time, I was like, this is crazy. I mean, like I, I, I believed, I, mean, I spent my whole life studying scripture and I believed this was the word of God. But I see this, I'm like, this is crazy. No, no dude could do this. I mean, I believe with all of my heart, John, probably through the use of an amanuensis, which is a scribe, penned this. But somehow, in a way that we can't fully comprehend, God was also involved in that process, and this came out. And it's like, when I see this, it's like, I wanna go grab everybody on the street and go, why would you not believe in Jesus? Like, why would you not think that there's something special about reading this book. I, I just, I hope that, I hope this <clears throat> makes you go, wow. I mean, can you imagine what it's gonna be like when we stand before God and we realize how much we didn't even realize was in here? Like, we're gonna be like, wow, man, I thought I knew something. I knew nothing. It's so incredible. And I think of the Emmaus disciples when they were walking, yeah. what did they say about Jesus? They said, didn't our hearts burn inside when he spoke? It's like, this is what the word of God does. You know, and it's beautiful too, because th th this, is, this is so, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to steal your thunder. I'm just like, man, if there, like, I've done this so many times and read this so many times, and I'm sitting here still just like, I cannot believe this. This is so cool. Keep going, man. You, you, yeah. This is good. <laughs> 
<clears throat> well, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Well, thank you for catching that. I'm, I'm here for you, um, man. I got you. The, the theme wonder occurs in both cases. John wonders at the woman at the well. Yes. And then when he sees Lady Babylon, he wonders, that Thalma, that wonder. That's right. So, I mean, it's, he's telling you how the godly should respond to this. When you see who she is, that's the response you have. You're startled, you're stunned to silence, you cannot believe. That's the reaction, that's when you know you know her. So, uh, we're at I now. No, uh, Jay. we're Jay. Jay. John the Baptist was a bright and shining lamp that Jerusalem extinguished, but they also extinguished the light of the world. Two witnesses were sent into Jerusalem. Always God sends two witnesses. What witnesses could ever exceed John the Baptist and Jesus for light? My goodness. The darkness was quarreling with the light. Okay, Jesus went up on a mountain and was with about 5,000. We know it was more than that, besides women and children. In Revelation K prime, a lamb was standing on a mountain and with him were 144,000. L, when the disciples had gone about 25 or 30 furlong, furlongs, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. And L prime, the bride of the lamb, I'm, I'm sorry, um, 1,600 furlongs, and he says, I saw ones who were overcame standing on the sea. That's incredible. So we are doing what Peter asked Jesus that he could do. Isn't that incredible? Um, M, the Pharisees complained that Jesus deceives the multitude. M prime, the beast deceives the earth dwellers. So the religious leaders are being exposed, they're bestial in their character and their rapaciousness and their nature. N, this is profound. The Pharisees bring a woman of adultery and stand her in the midst. Tremendous story, by the way. D don't tell too much of it, because I'm preaching that in two weeks on the weekend. Yeah. So, you know, Chips. Hold, hold back a little. So Chip's I preaching that, so bring, be sure and bring your stone. <laughs> 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 I got to set it up, right? So, anyway. The Pharisees bring a woman of adultery and stand her in the midst. The woman's accusers want to destroy her by casting stones. Casting, hear that? Accusers. Jesus said, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. The religious leaders are driven out of the temple. They're shamed out of the temple. Look at in prime. The dragon stands before the woman to devour her child. The devil is the accuser. He is cast out, cast down of heaven. The dragon who accused the brethren is cast out of heaven with his angels. Now, why is that significant? Many of you have Bibles that will take the story of the woman caught in adultery and tell you it's not part of the original text. Do you know that? The oldest manuscripts it doesn't appear in? Chiastic structure overcomes all those textual critical errors of men. It shows you it, that story is placed precisely where it should be. That story is in the middle of a number of chiastic patterns that show that is authentic scripture. The ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 to 20, that is authentic scripture. It was not lost. Chiastic patterning proves it's deeply embedded in the uncontested parts of the gospel. It's all this satanic, did God really say that? God did say that. You get your Bible back to you, given back to you. Oh, um, 
The religious leaders say, if Jesus continues, the Romans will take away our place that is in the temple. Their whole horizon is this life. There are many like them and are not living with the horizons and the vision of the life to come. All of our treasures and privileges are in this earth. That was their folly. Because look at what happens in heaven. There was no place found in heaven for the dragon and his angels. They will be cast out of their temple soon enough. And the Romans will come away to take away their place. And then the center climaxes, as we said, the Greek word for ladder. That will become significant in a moment, but anyway. It builds to a climax. The climax, the center of Revelation, corresponds to the center of John. So we put them here with this X, the chiastic center. There are thunders and angel voices heard in heaven. John 12, Revelation 11. Satan is cast down to earth from heaven. John 12, Revelation 12. Jesus sees Satan cast out. So this is a, a window of time. What Jesus is describing is what is going on in heaven at that moment of time. It's the center of John's thinking about Christ. Satan is cast down to earth from heaven. In chapter 12, in chapter 13, he will incarnate himself into Judas at the supper, you may remember. Christ is lifted up on the cross, and then he ascends to heaven. He's lifted up on the cross in suffering. He ascends to heaven in glory. And that's the fundamental way that John wants you to think about Jesus. He is going to be triumphant. However dark it appears to be, however mighty his enemies appear to be, he will triumph. Through suffering, he will bring glory, and he will bring that for all of us. Okay. Please, stay up there. We got, we got one more, remember? Are you gonna do it from here? You can do it from here, come on, come on. Sit next to oh, me, okay. he'll be on my right hand. So, um, gotta keep him in line. Can we really yeah. trust you to give us directions or? <laughs> come on, right here, man. Um, so the, the next part here that we're gonna do, this is, this is incredible. I mean, incredible. <clears throat> So when Warren was at the University of Dallas, he was already a Hebrew scholar. He had already had a law degree and he studied literature. Studied under probably the greatest person, at least of our generation, if not. Yeah, two, there were many, but, yeah, but Louise yeah, Cowan. Louise Cowan is amazing. You know, I think she got an award from almost every president and she, I mean, incredible. She's deceased, but <clears throat> Warren's dissertation for his PhD was on the correspondence of John and Revelation. And when he was defending one of the people that was on the committee reading um, was at the time considered one of the, 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 the best scholar on the apocalypse on Revelation. And he was told specifically that this right here that we're getting ready to do, just this, was worthy of a PhD, just this. And it started from not being able to make sense out of the Johannine passage in John 151, where there's heaven opened and the angels ascending and descending. And so looking for that. And, and, you know, if you look in the commentaries, <clears throat> a lot of them just don't even, it just like, it just, it's like it didn't even happen. Like, it's like you just jump from one. It's like, We're, hold on, you didn't even comment. Um, and then when they do, they have some, you can tell, not quite sure, or, you know, yeah, we sort of think maybe, or, you know, but there's really no consensus. And so what, what we're going to do here to end the evening is we're, we're going to look here at John's great vision of the seven last angels. And 
I would tell you to really lean in. That this, there, it, this is dense for sure, but it is incredible. And uh, um, I'd ask Warren to make sure that he did this, and this will help you understand some of the correspondences as well between John and uh, Revelation. So, you, 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 yeah, you, let me get a, let me get a little bit personal here okay. and tell you how this happened. Sure. Um, I was working in law, but I was also working on this graduate master's program at University of Dallas, uh, which is a Catholic school. It's a wonderful school. And um, uh, I, 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 I fell in love with Plutarch, loved Plutarch, still do. He's amazing. That explains everything. Has anybody else explains. fallen in love with Plutarch? Anyway. <laughs> and nobody reads, unfortunately. It's a shame. We should read Plutarch. But he writes the lives of parallel Greeks and Romans. And his ultimate pattern for the righteous life is Socrates. He's writing about 120 or so AD, right at the time at the end of the New Testament period. And um, so I, I was looking for a topic for my master's thesis, and I wrote on the life of Lycurgus, which is the founder of Sparta. And I noticed going through it, it's very clearly marked, the whole, whole book on Lycurgus is chiastic. And so that set up in my mind, the Lord was Lord laying out little crumbs along the way. The Lord is so gracious. And I was going to write my dissertation on Plutarch, but the wife of, of my major professor, Dr. De Alvarez, Helen, said, you really need to write on Revelation. And so I took that seriously, so I thought, well, I'll write on I'd done a lot of work in it, and so I'll, I'll, I'll work on Revelation. And I was writing a popular book at the time. It was an imaginary dinner in heaven where you'd be able to sit at table and talk to the authors of the New Testament. And one of them, of course, is John. And I, I thought, I can't, I can't put John's two great books together. I don't know how to fit them together. And so. Um, I shared that with some friends of mine, I thought, and I prayed, I, Lord, I don't, I don't know how to reconcile these two books. They're very different. And so um, I prayed at it, but you know, I'm Presbyterian. We don't, I, our prayers are challenged sometimes because we know God's got everything figured out already. <laughs> so, but uh, others were praying for me, including a friend of mine, my best friend. Um, they were praying for me. I, I thought, and I came, what had, how it had happened is I'd come to the passage in John 1, uh, 51, and it's the promise that Jesus gives to Nathaniel where he tells him, uh, Chip has already referred to it, but he tells him very specifically, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, and it's Nathaniel, but it's plural, which confounded me. You will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And I thought, well, that's nice for Nathaniel, but how am I to see that? Where, where do we see that? You read the commentaries and there's no clue. It's not ever, usually they don't even refer to it. It's clearly related to Jacob's vision at Bethel. Remember when he dreamed upon the stone? And he called that stone, he anointed it, and said, this is the house of God. And then he, he, the stone was his pillow. Not a very, not a my pillow guy, I guess, <laughs> but anyway. He, uh, he dreamed a dream, and he saw a ladder set on earth up to heaven. And at the top of the ladder was the Lord God, Yahweh. And the angels of God were ascending and descending. Now the ladder is not a fireman's ladder. It's a, it's a ziggurat, it's a pyramid, step pyramid. It's, it's a, a structure. The angels of God ascending and descending, they obviously have tasks to do on earth. They report back. He saw this vision of angels. And so I, 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 I was a little bit bold in my prayer. I said, Lord, I, would, I wanna see this. That's bold for a Presbyterian, but anyway. <laughs> I want to see it. I wanted. I hoped. I wanted to see a vision. I wanted to see, see this, this Jacob's ladder. 
That's the center of the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. This ladder that connects heaven and earth, it actually is the heavenly response to the Tower of Babel, which is man trying to reach up to heaven. And, you know, but God sets this, this uh, ladder, this uh, staircase. And so I went on, you know, and uh, um, so I was studying John, I was studying Revelation back and forth. And when I came to the Revelation chapter 19, um, I, I, others had recognized the seven last angels are chiastically uh, presented. And what, what, what Jesus had said, and I, I thought, well, how will I know if I see it? What, how, what, will, what will let me know that I've seen it actually? And Jesus says, you will see the heavens opened, one clue. And the angels of God ascending and descending right out of Genesis 28 upon the Son of Man, who becomes the ladder, the mediator, the connector between heaven and earth. So I knew that that's what I would see if I were to recognize it. And so I was stumbling around in Revelation, looking at chiastic patterning, Niels Lundford had talked about the seven last angels are arranged chiastically. And the fourth angel is described in verse 19. And um, let's see, where is that? 19. Yeah. Um, he says, where is it? This is a little hard to read for me. What are you looking for now, right now? Uh, 1911. Yeah, right here. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, then he said, oh my God. this is the, yeah, that I need, I've got my aged presbyoptic eyes. I so. didn't give you a good Bible to read out of. That's no, a, that's, that's okay. That's it's a small fine. text. He says, describing the fourth angel, which is the center of the chiastic arrangement of the angels, John writes, then I saw heaven opened. You will see the heavens opened. And he, he, he describes, behold a white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His, he describes his face. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows except himself. And he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God, it's Jesus. He's describing the face of God. Peniel is the face of God, that's what Jacob saw. He sees the same one as that Jacob saw at Peniel in Genesis 32. The one with whom he wrestled, he sees that face. When John sees that face, he recognizes it as the Lord Jesus. Don't ever let anybody tell you that John doesn't know that Jesus is God. It would be utter blasphemy for him to tell us about the face of Jesus and call him the word of God if Jesus is not God who is at the top of the, mat, the ladder that he's clearly patterning on the vision that Jacob had in, in Genesis 28. And then as I look the virginal city. Lady Babylon is in the wilderness. The virginal city is in a garden. They're chiastic. There are two angels in heaven. They're on the level with the sun and they cast things to the earth. And then there are the, the, the next two angels. You've got one and seven, then you've got two and six. They had descend from heaven to mid heaven, but not to earth. So the chiasm is building a ladder of angels. Ascending and descending language is used. The angels are ascending and descending upon this ladder. And when I saw that, I knew immediately, like in a, in a flash of a moment, I knew these books, Revelation and John are chiastic. And I began to work it 
out with, in my mind and then with uh, my friend, a number of friends that worked with me on it. And we, we began to put these charts, we began to assemble them. The first one we was with the chiastic chart, but we kept seeing things that weren't chiastically arranged, they seemed to be parallel. So we were kind of aggravated, we tried to see if we could fit them in, but we couldn't, so we kept a list of the ones that were parallel, and then the, par the parallel chart came out of that. Then we saw the seven trumpets, and the city that falls, and we thought, well, there's a typology going on here too. That's the story of Jericho. And each Which the one of the church fathers had already concluded. They had concluded that, but I, <clears throat> see, I, I was presenting my dissertation to a Catholic faculty, and this one uh, asked me, you can't be, he told me, he said, you can't be the first one to come up with this. Have you looked at the church fathers? And that had never even occurred to me. I was raised Protestant. And Protestants don't read anything before 1517. Seriously. It's true. That's much to the limitation of our horizons. These men, the fathers, were taught by the apostles. So they saw all of these things. But we've forgotten them. So, anyway. Um, Do you want to show that? So I'll show you the, I'll and, show the graphic. And while you're walking over there, before I click it, um, the, I think probably the last big commentary two volume set that just came out Peter Lightheart um, <clears throat> you can get it if you want it's, a, it's probably one of the latest commentaries in Revelations two volumes pretty thick um, Peter Lightheart's a friend of Warren Warren and him lecture together and in that commentary he, he spends first part saying that there's no, no greater correspondence between John and Revelation than what Warren Gage has done, and, uh, um, and it's just true, <clears throat> you know. And Peter's a good dude. Peter's smart. He's a smart guy, you know. So, Peter's, yeah, anyway, Peter's I'm just saying guy. this isn't like just some crazy thing. That there's scholars that recognize this and see how powerful this is. And so, you want to show them the? Here we go. You ready for the big reveal? Here's the. Hopefully, you can read. John said, "You will see," and I think you will see. He's going to show you, but but it it. it just strain. <clears throat> might want to cut the lights for this one because it might be easier to see with the... This is from chapter 17 to chapter 21. All of that is a unity. I recognized it when I saw in 1911, now I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war, and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's so beautiful. On, in the consecutive chart, remember what they're doing on earth is mocking him, writing a name. This man says he's Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But in heaven, he has a name written by the Father. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. It's magnificent. Most beautiful vision of the heavenly Jesus, the most beautiful vision of the earthly Jesus is, is Revelation chapter one. But this is the heavenly Jesus. Now here, the first angel, and one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls spoke with me saying, come. You can see that the language that's bold, bolded is the same in both boxes that corresponds to the seventh angel then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls just like he had started this one full of the seven last plagues spoke with me saying come and i will show you the bride here i will show you the judgment of the great harlot and he led me away in the spirit and he led me away in the spirit very chiastic type patterning you're clearly to correspond this, but this angel speaks of the beast ascending, this angel speaks of the holy city descending. Those are the two key words in John and Revelation. Angels are always ascending and descending, bind between the two books. So, um, clearly chiastically patterned. Then you have the second angel that corresponds to the sixth angel, 
After these things, I saw another angel descending from heaven. This one comes down to a wilderness. This one comes down and shows the high mountain. So those are on earth. This one descends into mid heaven and the sixth one. And I saw an angel descending from heaven, but not coming to earth. So you've got two angels on earth, two angels in mid heaven. After these things, I saw another angel descending from heaven, having great authority. Fallen Babylon is made a dwelling place for demons and a prison for every unclean spirit, because all the nations have drunk the wine of her wrath. This one, in mid-heaven, I saw an angel descending from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain. And the devil, bound, is thrown into the abyss and locked in, so that he should not deceive the nations. So the devil is going to imitate Christ in being sealed up, remember? And then he will be released a little while. It imitates the resurrection. But he's released to go to perdition, to his final judgment. Here, the third angel corresponds to the fifth. And one mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. He's in heaven saying, thus with violence shall Babylon the great city be hurled down. The sixth angel, and I saw one angel standing, you got the one angel and the one mighty angel, standing in the sun who speaks in a great voice of judgment upon mighty men. And the beast and the false prophet were hurled down into the lake of fire. Very clearly from mid heaven, hurling down onto the earth. And then the center one is the fourth angel, who we know is the angel of the Lord, the messenger, it's the Christ, it's the Lord Jesus. I saw heaven opened. John is the one who sees this, but that's why the you will see is plural. It's not just a unique message for Nathaniel, it's for anyone who will open their heart and see the, see the Son of God. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He's not on a, the colt of a donkey. <laughs> it's not the time of his humiliation. This is the time of his great triumph. I saw him on a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called faithful and true. How beautiful is that? Don't we want a leader who's faithful and true? <laughs> and in righteousness he judges, my goodness. Look at that. Don't you long? Don't you see what God is doing? He's creating in us a longing, a longing for Christ, who would render righteous judgment. Faithful and true, in righteousness he judges and makes war. And on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. John sees him on a horse. The prominent feature is, of the horseman is the thigh. But here he's greater than Jacob. This is true Israel. He wrestles in the garden, the word agony, agonizo in Greek. When Jesus went into the garden, he was wrestling with God. What, what was he wrestling about? That's his, that is his penale moment where he wrestles with God. He wrestles for you, for me. And he prevailed and resolved to drink the cup for us. He loves us. So there is no weakness in him. There is no weakness. Only strength. And that custom of the Jews not to eat the sinew of the flesh is because they will not accept his kingdom claim. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so what I'm hoping up to this point, I'm hoping that when you open up the book of Revelation and you see that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I hope you can see how all of this is working. It's telling us who Jesus is. John in Revelation 
that they're, they're, they read together. And you have made it through three tough evenings of a lot of material. And here's the beauty. We're gonna be off for a week and then we're gonna pick up again for three days. Th they will not be as tough, but what you learned here will massively inform what we do in the last three nights of this class. And you will also need to pay attention on the weekends because as we talk about the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, I want you to be thinking, who is Mystery Lady Babylon? Because we need to answer that question the last weekend of this month. And when you see her, you will marvel. And we will talk about what the great city is. And a lot of that you should be seeing in these charts. You should, you should be, but I'm not gonna tell you any hints, but you should be seeing, hopefully some of you see them. But uh, that being said, we're, we're a little early, which is great. We get you home. And uh, one more <clears throat> comment. You got one more, one more. You got one hey. thing I forgot to share, and I, I debated whether to share this, but I said that the mathematical demonstration of a chiasm is a helix. Remember that? And it's like a spiral, like a spring. And that's what we were doing. We were going through these books, looking at the extremities and moving toward the center. But it is a diptych. Each one of them is a spiral. Each one of them is a helix. But the interweaving of them is a double helix. Isn't that amazing? My goodness, is that the fingerprint of God? It's the whole image of life. What is the, per John says, I wrote these things about these signs that you might see and believe and in Christ have life in his name. The mathematics of it is imitating the DNA of life. It's total folly to the world, absolute absurdity. To the children of God, we know God works these mighty signs. And what a refutation of all of the critics and the naysayers and the skeptics of the faith. I, I don't know, I mean, but it's fascinating to me. And I'm not surprised if God does something like that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, um, we'll uh, <coughs> actually get you out of here early, which is good. And uh, um, I, I do want to say, though, before we leave, that I realize what a great sacrifice coming Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday was, but it, it does not substitute for showing up for church this weekend. Um, <coughs> just, just saying, because it's important that we gather. But uh, um, have, ha have you enjoyed this so far? And, and would you say would you say that in some ways that your appreciation for Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture has gone up? Yeah, good. good. That's good. Well, um, we will uh, we'll hang out and talk with whatever you want to talk about. Um, please be safe going home. Let me say a word of prayer, and we'll uh, we'll get out of here. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to do this. I never, ever, ever take it for granted because I think about all the other people in the world that are enduring persecution meeting in secret and have none of the abilities and talents and opportunities like we have we are a blessed people and I pray Lord that we would be reminded that to whom much is given much is required Please, Lord, help us to, uh, to not take these things and just sit on them or consume them as if we're at some buffet just for our own self. Lord, I pray that the word of God that is implanted within us would 
would grow and mature and that we wouldn't just know you in, in some intellectual way, but Lord, we would have a real relationship that changes us and moves us and, and energizes us to want to take what we know to be true and to share it with others. Lord, we live in a day and age where there's a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Lord, you have written these books to us so that we have hope. And our hope is in you. You will provide. You will take care of your people. You will always do what you say that you will do. You are faithful and true. Lord, I pray that that would be something more than we pray in words that we just say. I pray, Lord, that that would be on the inside of us passionately and that we would grow as your people and become the people that you've called us to be. Pray that you'd bless every single person here and those online because you promised that we would be blessed if we read this book. And Lord, I think that as we're reading this and looking at this, you are absolutely right. We would be blessed because what we will be blessed with is to truly see who Jesus is because you said it was the unveiling of who Jesus is. And we're seeing it more and more and seeing it clearly and we love you for it. And it's his, in his name we pray, the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. amen. God bless everybody. See you back this uh, weekend. And uh, next week, don't come Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday because we won't be here. Okay, but the following, we'll get together. We'll, we'll, we'll get all that information. Blessings, everybody. Have a great evening.